Hey, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you all for joining us today for this very important webinar where we're going to be talking about the opioid crisis in Kentucky, specifically relating to public libraries. My name is Charlie Taylor. I'm one of the CE consultants here at KDLA. I'll be your moderator for today's session. Um, you can communicate with me and the presenters through the chat pod, which will always be in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. You'll see the screens change, but it will always be in the bottom right-hand corner. You can use that chat pod to let me know about any technical issues you might have and to send in any questions you have for the presenters. Um, we'll be answering questions. Uh, our presenters will be answering questions as we go. If any of them get skipped, I'm going to be keeping track of those, and we will get to your questions before the end of the webinar. And if you're one of the libraries that has multiple people watching together on one computer, you can just send me a, an email with a list of the people who are watching it with you and I'll make sure you all get credit. This webinar is being recorded, and Perfect. it will be posted. Oh. Oh. Good and deal. Just Thank you. Be aware that for our presenters, we can hear you. <laughs> so if you want to mute your phone on your end, that would be excellent. <laughs> um, until, your turn, until it's your turn. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and it will be posted on the KDLA archived webinars page within one week, so you'll be able to go back and review this information and, or share, share the link to the presentation with your coworkers. Okay, we're going to move right into our presentations. Our first speaker of the day is Van Ingram. He is the Executive Director of the Office of Drug Control Policy. Um, now, we were very pleased when Mr. Ingram agreed to present with us. He's definitely an expert on the topic, and he has a long history with Kentucky law enforcement. However, some of you might have heard that this afternoon, um, Governor Bevan has called a press conference uh, regarding the opioid epidemic, so very timely, um, and Mr. Ingram was called to be present at that press conference, which I think is scheduled for 2 o'clock. So. Um, he, Mr. Ingram still very much wanted to present his information, so he came to KDLA earlier this week and recorded his portion for us. So we're going to be listening and watching um, his basically webinar recording that he made for you all. So if you have questions about his content, he does provide his contact, contact information at the end, um, or you can feel free to go ahead and chat in your question, and I'll pass the question on to him, or perhaps one of our other presenters might be able to answer it for you. So we want to definitely thank uh, Mr. Ingram for doing this, and I'm going to go ahead and start the recording, and we'll be listening to that um, for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Good afternoon. My name is Van Ingram. I'm the Executive Director of the Kentucky Office of Drug Control Policy. I've been with the office since 2004, uh, since it was shortly after it was created. Um, before that, I spent 24 years with the Maysville, Kentucky Police Department. My last six years there was as chief of police um, before coming to state government. Today we're going to talk about uh, the opioid crisis here in Kentucky and across the nation. Um, we're going to talk a lot about heroin and a lot about fentanyl. Um, but before we do that, um, I want to talk just a few minutes about how we got here. You see, we're really here as a result of, it's not George Clooney and Mark Wahlberg's fault, it's actually a, a perfect storm that brought us here. It starts in the, in the 90s when a drug company called Purdue Pharma launches the largest marketing campaign that's ever existed before or since to market a drug, that drug being OxyContin. Uh, the good folks at Purdue spent a lot of money and a lot of effort uh, in marketing this drug um, and did so with a lot of, and them and other companies, with, with a lot of uh, misinformation. Um, we, physicians were told that if people were in real pain, they couldn't get addicted to opioids. They were told things like, uh, because of OxyContin's time release, it was less susceptible to addiction. They were told about an, uh, uh, an article uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, that pointed that less than 1% of the time was there a risk of addiction. Of course, it, what they weren't told is it wasn't an article. It was a letter to the editor, and, and it wasn't a research study. It was actually a chart review uh, of some patients at Boston, Massachusetts Hospital being treated on an inpatient basis with opioids for pain 
that less than 1% of the time the nurse had documented in the chart that the patient was showing signs of addiction. So it really didn't mean anything. Um, but a lot of misinformation was put out there. The other side of the perfect storm was the Joint Commission on Hospital Accreditation about this same time declared that pain was the fifth vital sign and it should be treated with the same respect as a respiratory rate or heart rate and given as much credence. Um, this really caused hospital systems to start to look at the way they were treating pain and treat it much more, more aggressively than they had in the past. Then the other side of the storm that comes is uh, reimbursement rates are starting to be tied to patient satisfaction surveys about this same time. So how people, how physicians, how hospitals get paid is directly impacted by the second or third question on a satisfaction survey, was your pain adequately addressed? All these things really pushed physicians into a corner. Um, and, and, and prescribing of opioids for all types of pain, chronic and acute, became the norm. Uh, when that happened, uh, at the rate that it did, uh, this was, it was a huge increase. The first year, OxyContin sales was $49 million. Within two years, it was over a billion dollars in sales. So a huge turnaround in a very short amount of time. Uh, because prior to that, um, physicians didn't prescribe a lot of opioids for pain. Um, and we really just changed overnight. Then the last part of the patient, uh, of the perfect storm was uh, around the same time, a lot of pain advocacy groups sprung up around the country and, and, and got very vocal and very, had a very good lobby uh, in Washington and a very good lobby with state medical boards to say that we were woefully undertreating pain. Uh, and, 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 you know, to, to a regard, that's true. Um, but we did what we often do. Uh, the pendulum went from one end stream to the other very quickly. And that's kind of brought us down this road. So in Kentucky, our overdose deaths have just continued to rise over the last two decades. Uh, statistically, four Kentuckians are going to die today. They're going to die a preventable death. They're going to die of a drug overdose. 150 or more Americans are going to die today. Now, that's the equivalent of a commuter plane crash every day in this country. You have to ask yourself, if we were losing a commuter airline every single day, we'd figure this out, wouldn't we? But see, there's a very powerful lobby in place who's, and, a, and, a, and a, an industry whose very existence depends on the high sales of opioid analgesics. Kentucky has a, some of the highest rates of viral hepatitis in the country. Uh, this slide is, is showing people that, are, that were, had a dual diagnosis of uh, uh, an opioid drug overdose, and uh, viral hepatitis. One of the uh, other offshoots of this terrible epidemic is, is uh, infants that are born with uh, an addiction to, or a dependence on, excuse me, uh, a dependence on opioids. Um, this slide uh, is showing up to 2015. I can tell you in 2016 that number was over 1,200 infants that were born here in Kentucky. Uh, suffering from neonatal abstinence syndrome. One hospital in northern Kentucky has gotten so used to uh, people being dropped in the parking lot of a drug overdose that they've actually put a gurney right there by the, by the emergency room doors for the people that are, that are dropped off in their parking lots of an overdose. Let's talk a little bit about heroin. Uh, the data we're going to use is based on medical examiner and coroner data, but bear in mind that, that uh, there's some, these numbers can, can go up. So of the 1,404 overdose deaths we talked about in 2016, about 34% of those had uh, heroin in their toxicology report. Uh, approximately 47% had fentanyl in their toxicology report. But it's important to note that the overwhelming majority of, of these deaths are polydrug. So it's, it's, it's rare that we just see heroin or we just see fentanyl. Um, we often see uh, drugs like uh, uh, benzodiazepines, uh, Xanax, Valium, uh, Gabapentin, uh, cannabis, alcohol. Um, very seldom is there only one drug involved. There are often numerous drugs. About 56% of those folks 
uh, who died of an overdose, well, even if it was heroin or fentanyl, they had had an opioid prescription prior six months to their death. 33% had an opioid prescription at the time of their death. And another 21% had an overlapping opioid and benzo prescription, which is a very dangerous cocktail. So if you look at heroin by county, the Jefferson County by far had the most heroin deaths, heroin involved deaths. Kenton, Fayette, Campbell, and Boone follow. And fentanyl, I mean, sorry, in, in, as it relates to fentanyl in 2016, same counties, just in a different order. Uh, looking at the first quarters, first two quarters of 2017, 414 deaths, about 29% containing heroin, 53% uh, containing fentanyl. We're going to continue to see a decline in heroin deaths, but it's not going to be because of anything we've done. It's going to be in the shifting market uh, of the cartels and uh, what, uh, what they're producing and putting into the illicit drug supply. This is kind of interesting. Um, you know, we all read the headlines when a young person dies, and it, it, it is tragic. Um, but if you look at our largest demographic in 2015, it was age 45 to 54. And the next demographic was 35 to 44. So this is, this is something we don't often hear about, but it's the 50-year-old truck driver who's been treated with chronic back pain for years, who's now having a hard time getting the prescription opioids that he he or she used to be on, and now they're seeking uh, heroin or whatever they can find on the streets to prevent withdrawal. 2016, those, we just flipped, and 35 to 44 became our largest demographic, with 45 to 54 being the second highest demographic. Um, so we often think of this as a young person's issue, um, but as you can see, uh, uh, it's after the age of 25 that the majority of these deaths occur. Now, this slide is deaths per capita. Uh, West Virginia has the highest age adjusted rate per 100,000. New Hampshire is second, and then Kentucky and Ohio tied for third. Um, in, in 2017, that, that actually went down, and we're now tied, or we're sixth or seventh, but the actual rate went up. Uh, so our rate didn't get any better, it's just other states got worse. Another piece of data set that I look at often is uh, uh, submissions to the Kentucky State Police Crime Lab. So anytime a police officer seizes a drug off a person or uses an informant to purchase a drug, those drugs are going to be sent to the Kentucky State Police Laboratory System for identification. You can see from this slide the, the huge increase in heroin from 2010 to 2016. And you can see in 2016 it started its movement downward, and that continues uh, in 2017. The counties in red here being the ones who have submitted the most cases to the KSB crime lab. Here we are with fentanyl, just a huge increase, astronomical increase from, from 16 cases in 2010 to 982 in 2016. And we'll talk about why that occurred here in just a few minutes. Counties in red, ones that have submitted the most fentanyl uh, submissions. The uh, uh, stars, the counties with stars in them, are counties that have seen carfentanil. Carfentanil is a large mammal tranquilizer, um, 50,000 times more powerful than morphine, one of the most deadly substances out there. This slide shows the uh, increase in heroin seizures along the southwest border from 2008 to 2012. You can see they quadrupled. Now, in 2012, we passed a bill called House Bill 1 here in Kentucky that really tried to address uh, the prescribing of opioids for chronic pain to make sure that it was more appropriate when it was appropriate. And as a result of that, I've had a lot of accusations of, well, you know, you all passed House Bill 1 and caused this <coughs> heroin epidemic. But this slide indicates that the move towards heroin, the increase in heroin from the Mexican drug cartels was going on prior to that. Uh, and, and this slide is from the 2013 drug DEA, DEA drug threat assessment, which uh, uh, expands on that uh, increase in heroin availability. We got here from a long history of opioid painkiller abuse. Um, we really were in Kentucky, Ohio, West Virginia, were ground zero for this epidemic. Uh, I've got a map in another program that I do that, that shows that uh, in between 98 and 2000, 
there were 10 areas of the country identified as having the highest rate of painkiller prescriptions. One was in Northern California, one was in Central Florida, the other eight locations were in Kentucky and West Virginia. Um, so we really were the epicenter of this epidemic. Um, we've seen increasing numbers of IV drug use. Uh, 12 or 13 years ago, one in 10 persons admitted that they uh, injected drugs. Uh, now it's really close to 10 in 10 of opioid addicts uh, are, are using IV ingestion. Certainly abuse deterrent formulations with OxyContin and Opana uh, has had some, had some impact on the uh, increase in heroin. The crackdown on rogue pain clinics that we talked about with House Bill 1 certainly has had some impact. A greater awareness on the part of our prescribers, and we'll talk about that further toward the end of the presentation, but and, and a drug cartels just recognizing the demand that uh, we were a nation that uh, used a lot of opioid medications, uh, a lot of people had an addiction, and they had a products that they could deliver cheaper uh, and easier for the consumer. Because four things will always impact the abuse of a substance, and that is price, can I afford it? Availability, can I find it? Perception of risk, am I afraid to be at rest? Am I afraid of injuring myself? And then the public attitudes. So think back to the George Clooney slide and the perfect storm, and then think about it in terms of prescription opioids and how that epidemic got started. The price was as easy as a copay. The availability was as easy as a physician or a nurse practitioner or a dentist. The perception of risk was none because it, it came from my, a doctor. It couldn't hurt me. They wouldn't give it to me if it was going to hurt me. And then the public attitude was everybody takes medication. So you can really see why this was a perfect storm. So let's talk a little bit about fentanyl. Prince uh, died of a fentanyl overdose. He wasn't addicted to fentanyl. Um, he was using, being prescribed Percocets for pain. Um, I suspect that uh, somebody tried to procure some Percocets off the street and that they actually were fentanyl tablets made to look like a Percocet. Uh, just recently, this week, we've learned that Tom Petty uh, also had fentanyl in his bloodstream at the time of his death. So this is not your mother's fentanyl. This is not fentanyl with a patch that comes from a legitimate pharmaceutical company. This fentanyl is produced largely in China. Um, the Chinese have very, very few, if any, precursor con chemical controls, um, which makes it very, very easy uh, for uh, rogue chemists to get the chemicals they need to produce fentanyl and then either sell those chemicals or sell the produced product uh, to cartels and others. So the profit margin from fentanyl is huge. Think about heroin. You have to grow it in the field. So you have to pay farmers to grow it. You have to have guards to guard the field. You have to take that agricultural product and turn it into a pharmaceutical when you can skip all those steps by just ordering the chemicals or the drug from the Chinese. Fentanyl is very easy to get online. If you have access to the dark web, if you know how to navigate in those waters, um, you can very easily go on and buy a gram or a kilo of fentanyl, car fentanyl, uh, and the United States Postal Service will deliver it to your house. They won't know what they're delivering, but they will deliver it. Uh, this slide is a drug called U47700. This drug was developed by a drug company years ago, um, was never brought to trial. It was too powerful. Um, they they never, never did anything with it, but that patent still existed out there. And we've had uh, a couple of deaths here in Kentucky as a result of this drug being mailed to uh, Kentucky residents. So a kilo of pure fentanyl could be purchased for about $6,000. If you take that into retail sales of a powdered form and you tell people it's heroin, you can make about $1.6 million on that $6,000 investment. But if you want to go a step further and uh, you want to buy a pill press off of eBay, you could do that for about $500. And uh, you can make it spend some, a little bit more money and get a tool and die set to make it look like a Percocet 30 or to make it look like a, a Xanax bar. And now the retail sales profit is about $6 million on that initial investment of less than 7000 So you can see it's uh, extremely profitable. And I, I predict it's a business model that's not going away anytime soon. So we're going to have to try to impact the problem through public education, increased access to treatment, enhanced penalties for major traffickers, 
a greater access to naloxone, a, a drug that reverses a drug opioid overdose. Senate Bill 192 in the 2015 session attempted to do some of these things. Um, it required coroners to work with Commonwealth attorneys when an overdose involved a Schedule I drug. It created a Good Samaritan provision. We, I can't tell you the number of parents I've sat down with who lost a child who was using drugs with other, other people, and when their, their child overdosed, everybody scattered and ran because they thought they were, would be arrested. Um, this gives a person, in this one narrow set of circumstances, if they call 911 and stay with the victim and, until help arrives, if they have a small amount of drugs or drug paraphernalia, they won't be arrested. Um, I think uh, it's, it's probably a pretty good trade-off if it saves lives. We made it clear in, in, in what, Senate Bill 192 that uh, naloxone can be prescribed to pretty much anybody or given to pretty much anybody without a patient-practitioner relationship. Um, we took out the word patient and put in the word person or agency, including a peace officer, jailer, firefighter, paramedic, EMT, school employee. Um, really wanted to make it just as, as broad as we can. Um, the goal is to get people to treatment. The goal is recovery, but we cannot recover. Someone in, who, who's not with us anymore can't leave a life of recovery. We put in a, a good faith immunity for criminal and civil liability for the administration of naloxone. And this became a drug that not only pharmacists can dispense, but they can also uh, prescribe it as well. We've had a a couple of thousand pharmacists in Kentucky who've taken the training necessary to be able to prescribe this drug. They've really stepped up to the plate. Um, you can go to my website at odcp.ky.gov and find a directory of pharmacies in your area uh, where you can purchase naloxone. The General Assembly passed a needle exchange local option. Um, I, I, I had pushed for needle exchange for a couple of years. I really uh, uh, was surprised that this got passed, um, but what, what the bill did was say that uh, if the local health department wants to create a syringe exchange, they have to put a plan together, present that plan to the city in which they want to locate, um, and the county government in which they want to locate, and if those two bodies approve it, they can do, do so. I really thought with that uh, language in there that we would only have maybe Lexington, Louisville, and one or two other communities. I'm proud to say we now have 42 syringe exchange programs across the state uh, in little towns and suburbs all across Kentucky. Recognize that uh, diseases like HIV and Hep C are, are rampant. Uh, not, not HIV not so rampant so much in Kentucky, but Hep C certainly is. Uh, and we have many communities that are vulnerable. After passage of the bill, the Center for Disease Control identified 220 counties in the United States most susceptible to a rapid HIV outbreak. Of those, 54 of those 220 counties in the United States are in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. I'm going to skip through a few of these slides here so I can get to. I earlier we talked about tougher penalties, and there, uh, there, there were some tougher penalties in 2015 and, and, and 192, uh, but they, those increased even more. Uh, in the 2017 session. Um, we created the offense of importing heroin, uh, which is separate from trafficking in heroin, and it requires uh, to serve 50% of their sentence. Um, actually, in, in this 192, they uh, established some funds to go to the Office of Drug Control Policy. Uh, that first year, it was $10 million. Um, in, in Governor Bevin's first budget, it was $15.7 million the first year and 16.3 in the second. Uh, the statute has us, kind of points us in the direction of how to use those funds. They're used for treatment in local jails for non-state inmates. Uh, they're used uh, in, in just to expand the treatment available in four state inmates. Uh, the Department of Corrections is the largest substance abuse treatment provider with over 6,000 clients on any given day. Um, we did a pilot program uh, with an opioid antagonist to uh, give people who are leaving prison who have an opioid use disorder, the opportunity to take a shot of Vivitrol. And Vivitrol is a drug that blocks the opioid receptors and uh, uh, will prevent anyone from overdosing. We've been able to get, provide funds to our community mental health centers who have really increased their, 
ability to do substance abuse treatment. We've supported neonatal abstinence syndrome programs around the state uh, that treats moms, uh, pregnant moms with an opioid use disorder and, and, and their babies after they're delivered. Um, we've supported the Department for Public Advocacy, the Public Defender's Office for a social worker program, and the prosecutors for a rocket docket program to try to weed out these low-level offenders who would be better served by treatment in the community as opposed to prison. So House Bill 333 in the 17 session um, made any amount of trafficking in heroin a Class C felony, and up to 100 grams or more a B felony, made 28 grams of fentanyl a B felony, 10 grams of car fentanyl a B felony. Those B felonies are punishable by 10 to 20 years, and all require 50% serve time before eligible for parole. One of the more important things that we did in that, in that bill was create a definition for fentanyl that includes all the analogs that are available out there. There are 840 potential analogs from fentanyl, and we wanted to make sure that all of those were illegal in Kentucky, and I think we hit on a definition that did that. We added fentanyl to the importing heroin charge, uh, and then we came up with a new charge called misrepresentation of a controlled substance. Uh, so when people are taking fentanyl and trying to make it look like a Percocet or Xanax, uh, that that would be a separate crime. Um, House Bill 333 attempted to or attempts to limit acute pain prescribing to three days. The Center for Disease Control says three days should be enough to treat the major overwhelming majority of acute pain situations. Um, but we created exceptions for chronic pain, cancer, hospice, major surgery, trauma, inpatient care, and a catch-all of just a, if a physician feels like it is a medical necessity to prescribe more than three days, they could do that as long as they document in the chart why they did. Why did we address chronic pain? Why have we addressed acute pain and prescribing in Kentucky? Because here in the United States, we have 4% of the world's population. And we use 99% of all the hydrocodone combination products produced in the world. We have 4% of the world's population, and we use 82% of the oxycodone products produced in the world. We cannot continue to do this and think that this problem ever goes away. We unintentionally create new addicts every day who are getting legitimate prescriptions, but not recognizing the addictive nature of these drugs and the problems they can cause. So what we're trying to do with, with House Bill 333 and, and earlier with House Bill 1 is trying to promote more caution, not just on the part of prescribers but on the part of patients, to recognize uh, that nobody else in the world has an opioid epidemic like we do. And there again, nobody else in the world prescribes these drugs the way we do. The good news is think numbers are going our way. 2011 was our largest year of prescribing opioids in Kentucky with over 371 million dosage units prescribed in the state. Fast forward to 2016 and we've reduced that by 70 million dosage units. That's significant and I, as far as I can tell no other state has had those kind of results. Those numbers will go down even further now with the three-day prescribing limit on acute pain. Um, that's progress we need to make but that's progress that won't show itself for years down the road. So everybody who has an opioid use disorder, when we pass a bill, they still have it. And, and so while these things will reduce opioid exposure in the future, um, it does nothing to help those folks right now who are suffering with this disease. For those folks, we've got to do a better job of getting access to treatment. Um, we've launched two initiatives to do that. Um, one is a uh, statewide uh, helpline uh, where folks can call and talk to a social worker and uh, learn about what kind of treatment is available and what each type of treatment does and try to make the best choice for them. Um, we have a treatment locator website that's launching uh, on January 26th um, that will uh, be kept up in real time. So providers will update every day how much availability they have in their program. And so we don't have expect people to sit on the phone all day calling 30 or 40 different places trying to find a bed, um, we'll be able to go to a website and do that very quickly. 
Here's my contact information. Uh, if I can ever be of uh, assistance to you, uh, if there's any questions you have, or if you have any great ideas I can steal, uh, just uh, give me a call, shoot me an email, and we'll be happy to respond to you. Thank you for your time today. All right, that was Van Ingram from the Office of Drug Control Policy. Um, as I said earlier, that was um, him doing his recorded portion of the webinar. We definitely want to thank him, even though he couldn't be here. That website that he mentioned at the end of um, where they're going to be live updating treatment facilities, that's what's happening in that press conference today. So you might be hearing about that in the news later today. We're going to move on to our next speaker. We're very pleased to have Patty Clark, Regional Prevention Center Liaison for the Kentucky Department for Behavioral Health, Developmental, and Intellectual Disabilities. And she's going to talk a little bit more about this from the medical perspective of the epidemic. So Patty, if you'd like to come on the line, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Charlie. And I just want to say Van's information is so staggering, but it's also just a really good reminder that it does take everyone to make an impact on this crisis. And so I hope that some of the information I'm going to share with you will help you do that um, with your staff and in your community as well. As Charlie mentioned, I'm, I'm a program administrator with the Kentucky Department of Behavioral Health. I've been working in substance use and suicide prevention for more than a decade with a focus on equipping community, community members to be active participants in prevention efforts. I thank you for your time and your interest in the topic this afternoon as well. All right. So some of the information, or most of the information I'm going to give you today is coming from the SAMHSA Opioid Overdose Prevention Toolkit. So just so you know that we've not just pulled it, um, made things up as we went along. Um, the toolkit originated in the Division of Pharmacological Therapies of SAMHSA, and it was first printed in 2013 and was revised in 2014 and 2016. And SAMHSA is the Substance Abuse Mental Health um, Services Administration and oversees all things behavioral health, such as substance use prevention, um, substance use treatment, um, suicide prevention, et cetera. All right. So we're going to get, get started. We're going to just really define opioids and overdose and, and then begin to understand their impact on the brain itself. So what, so you may be asking what are opioids? Opiates. There, so it's important to know that there's a difference between opioids and opiates. Opiates are natural products, while opioids are synthetic products. The opioids include hydrocodone and oxycodone. And Van mentioned hydrocodone is a, a huge player in this, this crisis, for example. And then opiates include the morphine and the opium and then the heroin that we're seeing on the streets as well. Um, it's important because many of the opioids that, that we're seeing abused are, in fact, le legal drugs. And if you remember back in some of um, Van's earlier slides, he talked about a high percentage of those who have died uh, from overdose actually had a legal prescription in the, at least within the last six months um, prior to their death. Uh, for this discussion, we're going to talk collectively about opioids and opioids, um, so I'm not going to distinguish between them as we move forward. Um, so what is an opioid overdose? When we talk about an overdose, we're saying that an individual has ingested enough opioids that respiratory depression and possibly death can occur. A variety of effects occur after a person takes an opioid, and those range from pleasure to nausea, vomiting, severe allergic reactions, overdose in which the breathing and heartbeat slow or even stop, and potentially death. An opioid overdose can occur when a patient deliberately misuses a prescription opioid or an illicit drug such as heroin. It can also occur when a patient takes an opioid as directed, but either the prescriber may have miscalculated the dose or an error might have been made by the dispensing pharmacist, or even the patient misunderstood the directions for use. So there are lots of factors that play into um, how, an, how an opioid overdose, specifically from a prescription, may occur. Van talked a lot about the current situation of, of opioid use in, in the state, and, in, and I want to look at that um, first setting that stage from a national perspective. Um, 
and, and really think about how opioid use has a societal context to it as well. This also helps us understand as communi community members our role in addressing the problem. So first, let's look at the impact of opioids across the United States and then in Kentucky. In 2015, 20.5 million Americans had a substance use disorder. Of those, 2 million had a substance use disorder involving prescription pain relievers, and, and more than half a million had a substance use disorder involving heroin. I think this information reminds us that the numbers of those with substance use disorder are significant, and you're going to come in contact with those individuals in your everyday work. And I know we've heard um, some reports that there, there are users, um, people who are using in your libraries. You may have some situations where someone might overdose in a restroom. I know my daughters uh, were in Louisville not too long ago and were on 4th Street Live and went into a restroom and found someone who had overdosed, and, and they were at a community event that was being held there. So. This is just a reminder that, that we could encounter individuals who are, um, are suffering from the impacts of an overdose at any given point um, in, our, in our daily lives. So drug overdose is the leading cause of accidental death in the U.S., and 63% of, um, of all lethal overdoses are opioid-related. Of those overdoses, 38% were related to prescription pain relievers and 25% to heroin. Again, a reminder that a significant number of these overdoses are related to legally prescribed pain medications. We will talk later about prevention efforts around this risk factor as well. So we also see the overdose rate increasing in parallel with that of the sale of prescription pain relievers and substance use disorder treatment emissions. Researchers have found that from 1999 to 2008, the overdose rate quadrupled. In that same time frame, the sale of prescription pain relievers also quadrupled. And from 1999 to 2009, the substance use disorder treatment emission rate was six times the 1999 rate. And this is just a reminder that as, as the number of, as the availability of these drugs are on the street, the use rate in, um, increases and the consequences of that use increases as well. Also, there have been some reports that the majority of heroin users started out as a prescription drug user. While this information may be correct in some situations, we are learning much more about the intersection of the two and the key point to remember is that heroin use often begins after a legally prescribed painkiller is used. This helps to reduce stigma of those using heroin as well. In most every situation, the drug user didn't choose to become addicted, but were prescribed opioids for a legitimate medical condition, and that use transitioned into an opioid use disorder. For that reason, it's important to understand that Kentucky has one of the highest rates of prescribing of opioids, and Van mentioned this specifically earlier as well, but in fact, of the top 51 counties in the nation with high prescribing rates, Kentucky has 10. Those include Owsley, Bell, Whitley, Floyd, Leslie, Perry, Breathitt, McCracken, Fulton, and Johnson. And we're talking 51 counties, 51 highest counties in the nation. Kentucky measures prescribing rates through the Kentucky All Schedule Prescription Electronic Reporting System, or CASPER. If you've ever been to a doctor and needed a scheduled me medication, your doctor is required to check CASPER before writing the prescription to ensure that you're not being prescribed scheduled drugs from multiple doctors. In 2016, the total number of opioid prescription dispensed in Kentucky was nearly 4.5 million. That's 101 prescriptions for every 100 people, persons in the state. That's equivalent to one prescription for every individual in Kentucky, including all the children as well. The top three counties in Kentucky with the highest numbers of opioid prescriptions dispensed were Jefferson, Fayette, and Kenton, which makes sense because that's where a large medical facilities are located and has, they have the largest populations. 
But what's even more interesting is the three, the three counties with the highest opioid prescribing rates, which is the number of prescriptions per um, 100 people, were Owsley, Floyd, and Clay. And those are some of those darker red counties um, on the right-hand side of your map in eastern Kentucky. It's important because recognizing that counties near you may have a high prescribing rate helps you understand the access to opioids in your community. It's also important to understand the source of the opioids. More than 50% of opioids used for misuse among those 12 or older came from a friend or relative. 36% were through a prescription or stolen from a healthcare provider, while the remaining 10% came through a dealer, stranger, or in some other way. We hear lots of stories about um, you know the dealers on the street, but in reality, a lot of a lot of these prescription, a lot of these medications are coming from legal prescriptions that are in the home. This is a reminder that commun community members can assist in the prevention process by talking with their friends and colleagues about safely securing your medication, and of destroying unused opioids received by a prescription for a medical procedure after you no longer use them. Not only do we have high prescribing rates in Kentucky, Kentucky had the third highest drug overdose fatality rate in the nation in 2015. The age-adjusted drug overdose rate in Kentucky was 29.98 deaths per 100,000 with 1,273 deaths. As Van showed you earlier, 2016, that number climbed to 1404 and we're still waiting on the initial numbers for 2016 to see how we did. The numbers on the map show the number of resident opioid overdose deaths in, the, in that county in 2016 and reflect only the overdoses of Kentucky residents who died of an overdose there. They do not include others who may have come in from out of, out of state and died of an overdose in Kentucky. So, now it's time to look at who's at risk for an overdose. Specifically, anyone who uses opioids for long-term management of chronic cancer or non-cancer pain is at risk for opioid overdose, as are persons who use heroin. Others at risk include those who are receiving rotating opioid medication regimens, who have been discharged from emergency medical care following opioid intoxication or poisoning, those who are at high risk um, for overdose because of a legitimate medical need for pain relief, coupled with a suspected or confirmed substance use disorder or non-medical use of, of prescription or illicit opioids. Um, non-medical use of prescriptions is the use of a legally prescribed drug in a manner for which it was not prescribed, including taking too much or using someone else's meds. Others who may be at risk uh, risk include those completing mandatory opioid detoxification or abstinence for a period of time and then who may go back and use again. They may not, um, their bodies may not react in, in the same way they did the last time they used. They may be at risk if they've recently been released from incarceration and who have it or and who have a history of opioid use disorder. And finally, um, those who misuse opioids and combine them with sedative hypnotic agents, agents resulting in a sedation of, and res of respiratory depression. Several populations are at an increased risk of overdose as a result of, of use and misuse. Um, adolescents, for example, in 2015 there were 276 adolescents um, were current non-medical users of pain relievers. 44% of those had an addiction to pain relievers. Nearly 8% had used heroin. 1.8% were, were current users, and 2.1% had a heroin use disorder. These are national numbers, not Kentucky numbers. Adolescents often become addicted after a dental procedure or a sports-related injury or treatment. So it's important for um, parents to be aware of that potential with their, with their children. Women are also more likely to have chronic pain, be prescribed prescription pain relievers, be given higher doses of pain relievers, or use them for longer terms. They also become um, dependent more quickly than men because of their body chemistry. 
The homeless population has been identified as being at high risk as well. One study shows that about 68% of cities reported that substance use was the largest cause of homeless, homelessness for single adults in their city. Um, and a recent study in Boston showed that overdose had surpassed HIV as the leading cause of death among homeless adults and found that opioids are responsible for the, more than 80% of, of the death of those homeless individuals. We also have increased risk um, among those persons living with HIV or AIDS. And we um, have one example of, of that recently reported in northern Kentucky where HIV cases went up about 50% in 2017, but HIV cases among drug users went up 260%. And so while the actual numbers are small, national health officials have warned that this increase in, in northern Kentucky may be the tip of the iceberg of coming issues similar to those that we saw in 2015 in Scott County, Indiana, where there was a large outbreak of both HIV and HCV, um, and more than um, 181 um, cases were diagnosed in a single year there, where they had started with no more than five. So we're, as, as a public health issue, we're expecting those numbers in Northern Kentucky to, to continue to climb as a result of the, of the high heroin use in that, that region. We also see um, high risk in incarcerated populations, in those with co-occurring mental health um, conditions. Uh, we, also, we know that about 22% of those with a mental illness also have a substance use disorder, and about 64% of those with a substance use disorder also have a mental illness. So it's imperative that if someone is treated for one um, disorder that they are, are also assessed to be at risk for one of the others as well, making sure that you're, we're treating those um, concurrently at the same time. But I think what's even more important is to realize that the risk for overdose exists in all socioeconomic groups and all geographic regions. There's not data, for example, that shows that those who are poor are more likely to overdose than those who are wealthy. And the same exists for those who live in urban, suburban, and rural areas of the state. Residents of one area are not more likely to overdose than residents of another. So this, you know, this is a situation that's happening in all communities across, across Kentucky. The risks are also increased in a couple of different situations. We might see a tolerance shift where someone has been using for a while and they change drugs or they, um, they use a different kind of drugs and, and that there's a shift so um, their overdose risk goes up. They may begin to mix drugs, which increases their risk as well. They may have poor physical health, which puts more stress on their heart, for example, um, by, by using uh, an opioid. If they switch the route of administration, if they go from um, an ingested to an injected um, administration route, they, they have an increased risk of death. Um, and if they're using alone, they're at a higher risk of overdose because there might be no one to seek help should that overdose occur. As we think about overdoses, it's important for us to look at the impact of the drugs on the brain and how opioid use changes brain, brain chemistry, increasing the likelihood of opioid use disorder. The opioid medications act on the opioid receptors in both the spinal cord and the brain, and they, intense, and they reduce the intensity of pain signal perception. They also affect brain areas that control emotion, which further diminish the effects of painful stimuli. When these drugs attach to the re receptors, they inhibit the transmission of pain signals. And so as, as a person uses, they need more and more drugs to get the same um, impact in their, um, after their use. So when taken as prescribed, patients can often use opioids to manage pain safely and effectively. However, even in that instance, it's possible to develop a substance use disorder. When properly managed, short-term medical use of opioid pain relievers rarely leads to an opioid use disorder or addiction. But regular or longer-term use of opioids can lead to dependence, tolerance, in some cases, addiction. Let's see. Let's try to move through some of these a little quickly. 
I think it's really important to think that um, over time addiction can trigger changes throughout much of the brain, and this is the primary reason that addiction is such a hard illness to manage. Uh, the good news is that it is treatable, and with evidence-based comprehensive care, addiction can be effectively managed, and many but not all of the changes in the brain that occur when, when a person uses opioids can be reversed. As I mentioned earlier, opioids work by binding to these specific receptors in the brain. They, um, they cause a lot of different impacts, such as uh, the, the feeling of pleasure, which is why people use them on a repeated, repeated basis. Um, you may have nausea, vomiting, severe allergic reactions, et cetera. So some of the laws we think about, so just understanding that information helps us understand why, um, why people might use drugs, these drugs. They may not be, uh, that may not be an intentional, in, you know, intentional um, decision to get addicted, but they've received the, the pain medication and they've, they've taken the drugs, they have the change in their brain chemistry, which then requires them to continue use and they may, their doctor may decide they're no longer uh, receiving a prescription, which will allow them, will encourage them to seek that medication at other places. Um, and so you have that, that just natural progression for some individuals after a, a legitimate use. All right. So now we're going to look at some of the current laws that help um, you around providing help to someone who's overdosing. We spent a lot of time looking at them specifically. <clears throat> All right. So, for example, Kentucky has a couple laws in place to protect um, the public when they utilize naloxone to save someone who's overdosed. KRS 217-186, for example, allows for the public to administer naloxone in good faith in an overdose situation without fear of repercussions. It includes immunity from criminal or civil liability upon administration using a physician-approved protocol, which is included uh, with most naloxone kits. The law also allows schools to keep naloxone on premises. Um, and those schools have access to protocols which have been provided by the Kentucky Department for Public Health. And while our numbers show that it's not our students who are overdosing, um, schools, especially in, in rural communities, are kind of the center and the hub of a community. And so there may be an individual who's at a basketball game, for example, or another school function um, that needs access to naloxone during, um, during those events or even after hours. The Good Samaritan Law ensures that someone who helps a person who has overdosed, even if they're using themselves, will be protected. It encourages those at the scene of an overdose to call 911 and to stay with the person who is overdosing until help arrives. It also works by providing immunity for drug possession and use offenses when seeking medical assistance for overdoses. It works by protecting first responders from needle sticks and other infectious devices by encouraging those um, individuals to let the, the first responder know uh, what's going on when they arrive. Um, however, it's important to know that it doesn't extend to outstanding warrants, probation or parole violations, or other non-drug related crimes. It also doesn't um, offer protection for sales of drugs for benefit or gain um, to those who are guilty of trafficking, um, to possession of controlled substance with intent to sell, uh, for operating as a major trafficking or arrest or charge for drug or alcohol possession for individuals with an open warrant. So it does not offer a free ride for drug use, but is designed to increase the likelihood that someone who is overdosing may access help, and then it also just encourages local community members to, um, to get involved in, and to provide assistance in those instances uh, where there's a potential overdose. So what can you do in, your, in your, um, your libraries and communities? One of the things is having um, at least two doses of naloxone on hand and train your staff in administering um, in cases of an overdose on site. There are resources in your community that can provide the naloxone doses as well as provide that training. And I know that was one of the early questions um, that was on the, the chat earlier 
so you can you can reach out to your health department or your regional prevention center within the community mental health center and they can connect you not only with um, a source for for your naloxone at no cost as well as connect you with someone who can um, help train you there have been lots of grant dollars that have been uh, pushed to the communities to help purchase these, these naloxone kits. Um, you can provide information to your patrons on storing medications. Scheduled medications should be stored locked up in the home. The Regional Prevention Center in your region can provide information to share uh, about this. And many also have access to lock boxes that can be provided to your patrons if you're, if you're interested. And I'm going to give you some information on those RPCs later. Um, you can provide information to patrons on safe disposal. Most communities have permanent drop boxes for unused medication, and the Attorney General's Office has also made available disposal bags where the meds are mixed with water in the bag and then those medications are deactivated and become safe to throw them in the trash. Again, if you check with your RPC, they, they can have some more information on that. Also, share resource information. You've got a couple of different fact sheets. Um, that you can uh, share with your patrons on, as an information site. I know a lot of you have um, information stations already located within your, within your centers. Um, the health department and the RPCs also have additional information that they could, they could provide for you if you're willing to, to share space for them to share that information. All right, so we've mentioned the regional prevention centers and the health departments as resources for your efforts. Um, if you go to the link, the, the dbhdid.ky.gov link on this slide, you can get a county-by-county county list of your appropriate resources uh, for substance use and mental health, as well as other uh, behavioral health issues. Here are some national resources that you might want to have available as well. Also, Ben mentioned, uh, ben, Van mentioned the um, the new treatment line that is um, coming online today as well. And so if you'll check um, your local news, you'll get some more information about that as well, probably later this evening. And you can have the link for that too. And as always, again, here's in some additional um, sites. I think Charlie mentioned that your download is clickable, so you should be able to have access to those pretty easily if you download the PowerPoints from today's session. All right, and so moving forward, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to, to reach out. And if I don't have the answer, I'll be glad to connect you with someone um, either at the state level or in your community who can help you um, as, you're, as you're working with your staff and other community members uh, to address this situation. I thank you for your time this afternoon. Thank you very much, Patty. We appreciate your time out of your busy schedule and uh, the information you're sharing with us. Our next speaker, we're going to move right along. Next we have Lieutenant Colonel Jeremy Slinker, Operations Division Director at the Kentucky State Police, and he's going to address uh, the epidemic from the perspective of our law enforcement. So I'll turn it over to you, Colonel Slinker. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for uh, giving me an opportunity to participate in this uh, webinar. To be quite honest with you, when Charlie first called me, and after I agreed to do it, I, I was really thinking, um, you know, why uh, this audience would be looking for this information. And then the more I thought about it, uh, there was a lot of things that came to mind that would make uh, the uh, public libraries uh, places where you would encounter this problem maybe more so than a lot of the other areas that, that I would traditionally think of. You know, the easy access, usually within walking distance to a lot, uh, it, obviously a public place, uh, free internet and Wi-Fi often, or free access to computers, which is often the way uh, uh, both uh, people addicted uh, to the opioids and heroin and uh, uh, also with that traffic in, in those drugs often use internet now to uh, communicate instead of phone. So, um, it started making sense the more I slowed down and thought about it. So I do appreciate the opportunity to get to present. A uh, couple things before we move through the slides, I'll say uh, on the Kentucky State Police's behalf, uh, we looked at this about probably when most people were looking at it a few years ago, 2015 and 16, 
as uh, heroin was coming pretty prevalent in the state of Kentucky, replacing in some areas our prescription uh, trafficking problem. And uh, we started seeing these overdoses even increase even more, and uh, we was trying to figure out what to do. So the first thing we had to do was um, kind of relook at our goals and objectives as an agency and uh, and our priorities. I think everybody would always would agree that you think uh, the uh, Kentucky State Police and highway safety go hand in hand. And it always will. Uh, you know, that will never change and nor will highway safety ever drop as a uh, priority. But in general, as an estimate, we, we have probably an average of 600, 650 fatalities a year. And then what we were noticing the obvious thing was that, you know, now we're having at least double that number in overdose deaths related to an opioid epidemic crossing the state. So I think it, it started to make sense to us to uh, to put drug enforcement uh, along with uh, education and treatment or our, our response, uh, harm reduction response, uh, higher on our list of priorities and focus and, and we moved it up into the number one category and started several initiatives to start addressing it. I think as uh, Van said, a very good friend of mine, we, we typically agree on most things in this topic that you know we're, we, we may or may not be able to solve it, but you know we got to do all we can do to uh, affect it. So we basically took a uh, three-prong approach uh, with the help of some funding sources, one being the ASAP board, the state ASAP board of uh, enforcement, education, uh, prevention, and treatment. That's the three prongs. Obviously, enforcement's our biggest one. That's our job. Uh, that's what uh, KRS directs us to do. Uh, and, and so that's our biggest role. Uh, we, we did in the enforcement area kind of switch to more of a, uh, let's focus on the, uh, where's it coming from, the importation of heroin and opiates, you know, when it was a prescription drug crisis, we focused, uh, started focusing on the prescribers and the distributors, and we made an impact. So we we're doing the same thing with heroin, fentanyl, and um, the other dangerous drugs coming in and being imported into Kentucky. And uh, we set a goal of creating five new drug interdiction teams that would be scattered through the state that would do that full time and be placed under our drug enforcement branches. So once we get a seizure on the highways, we would then follow that up with an investigation and not just stop at the seizure and the courier, but try to find out which cartel or maybe major source city the drugs were coming from. But we all also wanted to try other areas that uh, I, we thought we could have an impact in. And uh, education and prevention, uh, you know, we've always done that through our media relations and public affairs branch. And in that, we're uh, creating a new drug education trailer. We've had a meth response trailer for a long time. Uh, it had kind of gotten older and uh, uh, wasn't in the best shape. So as we're replacing it, we're trying to make this one uh, newer in technology. And as drug trends change, we can change uh, it, the trailer as well. And that'll be available to take around to almost any community event, uh, even such as a, by request of, by a library or a school or a, any other community program. And we've also worked really hard on developing a new uh, opioid uh, heroin program that can be taught in schools and or uh, other community groups. And so we're going to really focus on that on, in the next year of the education and prevention. And then in the treatment side, you know, that's a limited area that we have expertise in, but we are getting ready to announce in a few days that we're officially going statewide with the ANGEL initiative, which is just where we'll help facilitate folks to get into uh, treatment. You know, we're not going to provide any, but they can come in willingly on their own and tell us they need help, and we've partnered up with some treatment facilities that we can make contact with and uh, provide transportation or, or, or have partnered with an angel group that would come and help them get them to the treatment centers. So that's a overview of kind of where the state police is on this problem.
I kind of wanted to start with a couple uh, slides that shows the trends. You know, uh, Van had several good slides in, the, in his as well. And just kind of show you some of the information that we're seeing and the amounts and how it's increased. Obviously, this is specifically heroin. Uh, most of the data is coming from our KY Ops uh, records management system where the majority of all police departments report their enforcement data to. And as you see, as probably it did statewide and nationwide, you see the heroin uh, possessions and traffickings increasing uh, every year. Uh, you still see the possessions, which is often more of your uh, user and consumer of it, uh, still going up. The trafficking is slightly uh, declined in the last year or so. Uh, we'll talk about probably some reasons for that in a few minutes. Uh, and then you have some heroin charges versus hospitalizations. Uh, you'll see the hospitalization stuff doesn't have as lengthy as history just because it took this epidemic probably for us to start paying attention uh, to those numbers as much. Uh, but uh, again, you see, uh, uh, go along with kind of Van's presentation, between 16 and 17, you see kind of a drop in um, your hospital discharges for overdoses and overdose sites in the ERs. And again, we're getting ready to talk about the reasoning for some of that. Sorry, went, went too far. There we go. And one reason I just wanted to interject this, we are a, a statewide focused on the opioid problem. And that is where people are dying uh, from the overdoses. But a trend in law enforcement we're seeing, and this comes directly on the business side of drug, traffic, drug trafficking, is crystal meth is uh, being imported in this state in amounts that are nearly unimaginable. And again, it just becomes a profit margin, competing cartels, uh, multiple reasons. Uh, and you know, and as the fear and education goes up, that people are starting to realize of the potential overdose with the opiate or heroin or fentanyl, then you know somehow you could almost make meth safer than heroin, which sounds crazy, but uh, that's potentially why you see an increase in the heroin importations into this. Kentucky at one time was a large meth manufacturer, and now if you look at the chart. Uh, on the left, you, we are, um, you know, we're, it's almost all importation now of crystal meth coming from the cartels. We, our, our manufacturing numbers are really, really low at this time. And I only show you this, this about meth to know that, uh, you know, people struggling with addiction and this disorder, you know, if heroin doesn't, isn't available, they're going to find something. And so, they may move to meth, uh, and you've seen some uh, examples of that in the previous presentation um, of the multi-drugs and poly-drugs. And meth causes people to uh, be more prone to violence or uh, unpredictable behavior than uh, even opiates or heroin would. So, and they are, from what we find out on the street, uh, more more difficult to deal with and definitely more prone to be violent in some type of response. So as you're dealing with problems with uh, uh, drugs infiltrating your all's facilities and you're all trying to come up with solutions to deal with it, just be aware that uh, if people are, are on this new crystal meth that you know they may be tougher to deal with, harder to reason with, and uh, may be very violent and dangerous. I'm going to read this question real second. One second. Uh, uh, to answer the question, uh, are you seeing meth in one geographic region compared to another across the state? Actually, no. Used in the past, the West Kentucky was the largest area of our meth manufacturer, and it still has meth manufacturing happen now, just not as many numbers. But uh, realistically, this crystal meth importation by the pounds, and that's how they're selling it, by pounds, 
pretty much statewide. So, uh, you know, as we're dealing with the heroin fentanyl problems, anywhere we're making a dent, they're, they're coming in and replacing it with meth. And again, it gets cheaper. Uh, right now, they're fronting a lot of it, which means they're giving it to their suppliers without charging them on the front end, making them pay on the back end, which is uh, very uncommon. But they're doing that to kind of spread it uh, across the state and make it readily available, which, as, as Van said, in his perfect storm is one of the uh, factors of that. Here's some signs of, of what to look for uh, when someone's, uh, this is particularly uh, for uh, heroin, but it, most of it will apply across the board as well. Uh, so, if, you know, if you encounter people and
and they're showing some of these signs, uh, you know, it, it may show you of some concern. And of course, you see the needles and spoons and things around that uh, you should be very concerned with it, it, because people using these narcotics are going to bring these things into your facilities. And at some level, your, your patrons or you are going to have to deal with them uh, at some point. Uh, again, the roller coastering moods is what I would say pay attention to. Uh, you know, that's the main thing I, I want to accomplish here today is for everybody to be safe. Uh, you know, I think uh, a couple of days ago, uh, I've been in Western Kentucky for the last year. shows you that uh, serious and violent things can happen almost anywhere now. So, you know, you, you, you may be applying logic to a situation and, uh, you know, and you may not be understanding why you're not getting logical responses, but, you know, typically, as already been shown, the brain has been re rewired and they're, they're not going to be logical. So uh, you may need to have some plans in place of how to be safe and what to do if you encounter any of these things. Some of the risk with this uh, uh, epidemic you'll run into. Uh, again, violence is always one I put out first. That's not everybody's not violent, but it, it can have violence in because, again, their brain's not working right. Uh, fentanyl exposure, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute about our, our use of uh, Narcan and Naloxone. But, you know, if you, uh, the more you learn about fentanyl, you'll learn it'll take a very minute amount to cause you to have a, a fentanyl exposure as well. And of course it depends if it's car fentanyl, fentanyl, or one of the other derivatives. But, uh, you know, if you accidentally inhale it, and that's what we run into it in the public safety realm a lot, you know, you're trying to figure out what you have and you may open something and it kind of puffs up, like if you were opening a bag or a purse or something and it puffs up and you inhale it, you could overdose as well accidentally. And, um, of course, you, you heard that, um, you know, this has also brought in widespread epidemics of uh, hepatitis and uh, other diseases that you must be aware of that if somebody does overdose and you're going to uh, go hands-on or, or their stuff, you know, you might ne need to be aware of. Uh, then needle sticks. So if you're picking up anything they've left, trash, bags, uh, fast food, wrappers, or almost anything they've left behind, be very, very cautious and kind of um, maybe move them around with uh, something other than your hands first or fill them because it can be very dangerous to some of the uh, diseases. And then, of course, you, you may encounter overdoses. And again, as I said before, with this problem it's gotten so serious, the overdose you have to be concerned with is the person there as, as well as, like, what do you do about that? as well as what do you do if you're exposed or when you, the other employees is exposed and overdoses. It's almost an equal concern uh, for, for the people encountering as well as the uh, person use, overdosing themselves from the drugs. A couple uh, solutions that I would say that we could uh, throw out. And, and a couple things, I'm trying to get to my questions that I know Charlie had sent me. Uh, you know, if you encounter these people, obviously, and it's an emergency, they're being violent or they're having a medical emergency, 911 is the best thing to do. Uh, I'd give them a call and they'll, they'll dispatch police, EMS, or both. And that, this problem has kind of went to that where it used to be either a medical emergency or a law enforcement problem. Now it could be either, so a lot of times both will come and show up. Um, if, if it's not necessarily an emergency, but you think you have a drug issue in your area or in your library, then you can obviously call the police and often talk, ask to talk to narcotics detectives or give anonymous tips, or you can be actively um, a participant in helping solve the problem by starting to communicate with that department that covers that area. And obviously, the 16 state police post uh, will cover all of those counties. You're always welcome to call them at any time or if you have a relationship with your local departments as well. And uh, speak with someone about the problem and come up with a plan of, you know, 
what you can do. Uh, communication is always the key to fixing things. Uh, you know, invite the police out to your facility for see if they'll give you maybe a more in-depth program. And the state police has developed, like I've said before, a program uh, that's much link more lengthy than this and much more informative uh, on, on this problem and the responses to it. So you can call them. They can come out, and while they're there, they could also evaluate uh, your facility, what you have, and give some suggestions of anything that you could help make it safer. Uh, and then kind of figure out your responses. You know, if if you have people, uh, someone becoming violent or just kind of uncontrollable or erratic or uh, and it's scaring people, you know, getting out is always an option. If it's if it's that bad, get away. If uh, if not, can, if they're out and they're trying to come in, have a quick way to secure the premises. Make sure your locks and doors are fixed where you can eat, do that quickly, maybe not necessarily with just you know a key at everyone or something, just more of a handle that you can turn. And or have a safe area within there like an office or something that would be difficult for someone to get into. Because as mentioned in uh, an email from Charlie, uh, many of you are in the rural areas, which is where the state police typically work, so that's where we're comfortable at. But we all are understanding there that sometimes the response isn't a matter of a few minutes. It may be 20 minutes or 30 minutes. So you may have to have some type of plan in place to get you to then. So moving on, a couple of solutions that I could uh, throw out and offer that we've looked at as an agency and we recommend. And of course, uh, as I always do, I'll kind of give you pros and cons of each. But you know. The, one of your biggest risks, I think, being a public place is encountering the uh, leftover paraphernalia from drug use and drug trafficking, spoons, needles, packaging, bags, all of those things. And um, you could um, get you a sharps container, as you see here, and keep it at a location where you've got at least somewhere safe for to put because you don't want to put those things in just uh, a regular garbage can and dispose of it where someone may accidentally uh, get exposed later. So sharps containers are always uh, good to have around uh, and pretty readily available if you contact any of your local medical uh, institutions, EMS or hospital or anything like that. Narcan, naloxone, uh, the state police started last year in 2017 and I think this spring of 17, and we, we because of funding, we didn't go agency-wide yet. That's our goal in 18, but in 17, we went to all our operational units, which is people out on the street doing uh, police work that are most likely to uh, encounter people that are overdosing or uh, possessing or trafficking in narcotics, especially these dangerous ones like carfentanil and fentanyl. Uh, and again, we do it for two reasons, not one more important than the other. They're both equally important. But, you know, uh, if we encounter someone overdosing, we now have a response to it. And a lot of, like we mentioned earlier, a lot of our responses are in the rural areas, so we may not be close to medical services right away. And then second, also for our own protection. We've, in, we've added it to our first aid kits like we've added a um, tourniquet and, and look at it the same way that you know, if we get exposed to some of these drugs, we may not have another response except for hopefully somebody there with you could use your Narcan on you and, and revive you to, or get you to the hospital. So again, our goal in 2018 is to go uh, agency-wide where everyone has it. Now, you can see we, we administered it from probably around June when we got it issued out everywhere, about 23 times across the state to uh, overdose uh, victims, and uh, that was kind of significant for me. I just, where we're rural and we typically don't respond to medical calls, I was shocked that we were already using it that often, so that just really speaks to the problem we have. And, uh, and one other note that I'd like to make is it often takes us more than one dose. So uh, the picture up in the right-hand corner of the uh, nasal spray, that's what we use. And uh, we issue each person two. And again, my, I'm not a medical expert, but what I've been told is each one of those is four millimeters. And that's 
basically two doses in each one of those sprays. And uh, we've had m multiple troopers or officers have to use all of their uh, sprays to keep a person or revive a person or keep them alive until uh, EMS gets there and administers more to, uh, to them. So I look for that to increase next year as well. And that's kind of where um, uh, the, the third thing I'll mention is not listed here. I think at least the basic thing you could do there would get some PPE, some personal protection equipment, gloves and a mask. So if you have to handle anything, you've got gloves that you can uh, put on and there's all kinds of uh, information out there what the best ones, nitro and that type thing, how thick on um, what to get to pick up needles and spoons and all that stuff we talked about. And so obviously we're supportive of all this because our job is to save lives and that's what we do. So we do the best we can and uh, these things help us do that. You know, some cons, and I, I, I don't, well, I don't even want to say a con, but just some things to be aware of that uh, we've seen as a result of uh, implementing a lot of these things is um, it may increase the uh, traffic uh, of this issue in the area because we've seen it uh, in a lot of our cities and towns and local places that uh, if the, they're using the drugs near the EMS stations or the fire stations or outside of the hospital and uh, what we've encountered recently in some of our more rural areas that we're working, uh, they're calling the state police post for a medical response for an overdose where they would normally call for uh, an EMS, but in that particular county, it's known that now troopers have naloxone, but that particular uh, EMS company does not. So we're becoming more of a medical responder, which is very odd for us, and, and it was unexpected. So, you know, it may create a place where if they have that, then you know you may see more of that come around and, and that's definitely what we've seen. So I think that's just things to know and as you implement are your sharp containers for you or do you put them out for the public like in the bathroom? That's things to think about. Uh, your Narcan, is that for you all to have safety or do you put in your first aid kit to have out to use? Just things to think about because we had to and like I said we've learned a few things along the way. Outside of that, uh, how do we do a lot of that is uh, we have to have a lot of funding. Like I said before, the Kentucky ASAP board has helped us uh, last year in 2017 and going to continue to help us in 18 uh, implement a lot of these things and even go further than we did. And this year we got a large um, uh, grant from the COPS grant, which we haven't gotten for several years. But basically we were told because we implemented that three-pronged approach, they're helping us hire additional troopers to apply to drug enforcement and additional intel analysts to cipher through uh, public health data and enforcement data and see where we could uh, target areas that are being affected mostly by it. So with that said, that's all I have. I appreciate uh, the opportunity again. Colonel Slinker, this is Charlie. Thank you so much for your time. I know you've had a terribly busy and difficult week, so we really appreciate your efforts and putting this together for us and coming back. Um, that's awesome commitment on your part, so thank you. I think I have a question here real quick, and you're welcome. I'm trying to read it real quick. Please, go ahead. Yeah, I think maybe coming up uh, for that question uh, about the respirations and CPR, uh, I, I noticed on the... Uh, agenda, there's a, a, someone from EMS coming up next that they may be better equipped to answer that question than I am. Like I said, we kind of developed some local training. Uh, we we have a medical officer within our agency that does got our prescription and then he worked with a uh, one of our troopers that's also an EMT and runs our medical program and they implemented training so it would be consistent across the state for us is kind of how we move forward. Excellent, and you're right, The next, our next speaker is involved with EMS, so I'm hoping that he's going to be able to shed some light on um, specifics of what overdoses might look like. Um, he is out there assisting people every day um, who might be overdosing. His name is Brandon Remley. He is the director of the Georgetown Scott 
County Emergency Medical Services. So Brandon, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, once again, I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of EMS Services in Kentucky and uh, share a little bit of information about what EMS agencies across the state uh, face every day. As I begin the presentation, I just want to uh, just let everybody know that in Kentucky, um, EMS services, depending on regions, depending on medical directors uh, over those agencies, um, may not always take the exact steps in which we take at our agency. So I just want to make that clear. So when I'm speaking, I'm speaking on what our agency does, um, and there may be differences in, in some uh, a agencies throughout the state. One of the big things is uh, in 2019, according to the Kentucky Board of Emergency Medical Services, uh, ground ambulance services administered 12,552 doses of Narcan. So that kind of gives you an idea of the number of responses the services have made through, throughout the state. Unfortunately, it's very hard to, to tell individuals how many times uh, services in the state treated individuals for heroin overdoses depending on the agency, depending on the provider, depends on how they record the information. Some agencies record it as an overdose. Um, some agencies record it strictly as an unresponsive patient. So to get accurate statistics is very difficult. Um, but in Kentucky last year, um, services responded to, I apologize for that, uh, services responded to 13,140 overdose calls. Now with that being said, um, some of those overdose calls could have been accidental overdoses as far as somebody taking too many of their prescription medications, um, or it could have been other types of overdoses, such as uh, small children getting into adult medication and so forth. So according to the World Health Organization, uh, about 15 million people suffer from opioid dependence. And this addiction covers all social economic groups. Locally, you know, we, tr we have seen and treated individuals from uh, individuals who live in government housing all the way up to those who live in very affluent neighborhoods. Most often, though, we, we find that we're treating those individuals who live in what we would consider our middle class neighborhoods. So, Sometimes we, we think about you know, drug ep epidemics being of lower class, but it is not the nature. And who are our users? We're finding that, or at least locally, we have treated. Our youngest patient has been 16 years of age, and our oldest patient that we have treated in the last three years has been 70 years of age. And that 70-year-old, uh, you know, once we treated that individual, we asked the question, why did you use heroin? And his statement was, it was cheaper than my prescription pain medicines uh, that I've been addicted to. So it kind of shows you know, the, the change uh, over the last few years from abuse of prescription pain medications to heroin just for the simple fact it is uh, a cheaper high for individuals. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. Uh, Patty did a really good job in covering and discussing the differences between uh, opioids and opiates. Um, but one thing I did just want to kind of reiterate was that according to the CDC, 9 out of 10 individuals who use heroin used at least one other drug, and 45% of the people addicted to heroin also are addicted to prescription opioid painkillers. So th as you look at the slide, you can just see some of the frequently used uh, painkillers um, that have been described by physicians over the years and could have possibly led to, to what we're seeing today with the heroin epidemic. Many of you have um, uh, typed in some questions as far as signs and symptoms of opioid overdoses. So what are the things that you need to look for if you find somebody? Well, most often you're going to find an individual who is unresponsive. Um, once again, knowing the different age groups, it could be of any medical nature. Um, unless you are 100% you saw the individual um, either snorting the heroin or shooting up or uh, shooting up what you think is heroin. But unresponsive. You, you, most of the time you're going to find that patient to be unresponsive if it's a true uh, overdose. These individuals um, will become cyanotic. 
their lips, uh, their fingertips will be blue. Um, they still may be breathing, however, the respiratory uh, rate will be um, dramatically decreased, uh, usually somewhere between uh, four and eight times a minute this individual may be breathing. Um, and if you, would to look, if you were to look at their pupils, they would be very pinpoint. The main thing is, is recognizing that they have a medical condition, and that's what we treat these individuals as. We don't treat it as an opioid overdose. We treat it as a medical condition because that's exactly what it is. There are many other um, issues that could be going on with this patient, so the main priority is if you recognize it is to call 911. So once again, you suspect that somebody has overdosed. First thing that you want to do is call 911. And one of the big things, just about everybody has a cell phone, and most of the time, if a 911 call is placed, it's going to be from a cell phone. Make sure that you are giving the exact location and stay online with the 911 operator. You have to remember, cell phones hit towers, um, and the tower that your, that your call may be connecting to could be in another county. So always make sure that you state exactly where you are. Don't just say Main Street. Um, just about every community has a Main Street. Uh, make sure that if you're in a particular area, I'm in Main Street, uh, Lexington, and give the exact uh, address. And try to stay on the line. All of our cell phones um, have the option uh, that you can lay the phone next to you, um, and you can put it on speakerphone, and you can talk to the 911 operator, giving them um, updated information as you uh, attempt to treat the individual. The other thing is protect yourself. You are number one. While we all want to be able to help these individuals and see them recover, we have to protect ourselves. So some of the things that you should be uh, doing, and this is not only with uh, somebody who has possibly overdosed, but with any individual that you may uh, provide care to. First is you want to have gloves, medical gloves. Any standard first aid kit uh, that you would purchase should have medical gloves available. You want to have eye protection, some sort of goggles um, or even glasses themselves that would protect from any type of blood, um, spit, mucus, any other type of uh, bodily fluid that could, could splash up into your face. If you need to provide um, rescue breathing or CPR, you want to make sure that you have a mask available. Um, these masks are, are available in a lot of your uh, medical supply stores, and they come with a one-way valve so that if you are giving um, ventilations and the patient would vomit, that is not going to come back up into your mouth. So that is a, a, one of the main things that you want to have. We've talked a lot about uh, Narcan or naloxone. If your facility has uh, the Narcan or naloxone, uh, once again, you, you can administer it. If the patient is awake and they're breathing on their own, you don't need to give Narcan. You need to give this when somebody is unresponsive. That's when you're going to need to give the, uh, the naloxone. Once again, it's very simple. Uh, you can usually gain training at um, your health departments, some EMS services provide the training, um, but basically it just goes up the nose and you um, dispense it and it's very simple to dispense. If you notice that the patient is not breathing at all, um, they're cyanotic, they have no signs of life, then you definitely want to automatically uh, go ahead and start your CPR. Once again, if you don't have um, personal protective equipment such as uh, a face mask uh, so that you can provide mouth-to-mouth -mouth, um, uh, breathing for the individual or gloves, you can do um, compression-only CPR. And once again, you can even view that, how to perform compression-only CPR um, if you go to the American Heart Association website. The main thing is to continue circulating blood to all the vital organs on the patient.